Glenn Van Zutphen on Saturday mornings with Neil Humphreys on Money FM 89.3. International News Review. Welcome back to Saturday mornings here on Money FM 89.3. Time for our International News Review. Welcoming Sharon Jeet Lale, international journalist. Good morning, Sharon Jeet. How are you? Good morning, Glenn. Great to be on. Great to see you guys. Hey, and since we have you on and since you're in the neighborhood, you live right near uh, Dover Forest, the story we were talking about earlier and you commented on Facebook Live. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? They've reserved half of it to stay natural for now. Uh, going to develop yeah. about 11 hectares of it. Uh, what are your feelings I, on that whole I am been keeping across the news and following the story very, very closely, Glenn. As you said, um, my, my home, literally, I'm looking at the window just out uh, onto the left of me and it overlooks Dover Forest. Um, I completely get what uh, Neil was saying earlier about the fact that obviously we don't want to lose this piece of paradise. It, it is paradise. You know, it's been there mm. for a, a couple of decades. Uh, there are these beautiful old trees. It's actually home to a, a lot of endangered species. I mean, I happen mm. to know because I overlook it and I have my cup of tea there every morning. There's, there's a yeah. nest for changeable hawk eagles. There's, there's a nest for straw-headed bulbuls. I mean, there's only a few hundred of these birds in the world, and most of which are here in Singapore. I mean, they've been decimated in the region because of the, the songbird trade, but they're nesting back there. And I think it is yeah. just absolutely devastating that, yes, I know it's a compromise. I know they are keeping the western portion uh, of the forest, but nonetheless, absolutely devastating that yet again, you know, this, this need for population growth, this need uh, to tear down, you know, a greenfield site when you've got brownfield sites just across uh, you know, the, the Gimel market right here, there's a huge mm. field just ready and, 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 you know, you could build on it literally tomorrow. You don't need to tear anything down. So a lot of us uh, on in this neighborhood are particularly devastated. Uh, by this. Um, you know, you were talking a little bit earlier about the need for green, you know, during the pandemic and the issues of mental health. It is ultimately something that is really going to be affecting many Singaporeans. It, it, there's so much research that's done about green spaces and yeah. how you need mm. green spaces to, to de-stress. Um, I, I think, you know, life is, is complicated. Things are getting crowded. People are getting stressed. And this is no way to, to add to all of that. Sharon Jit, obviously I couldn't agree more. As, as, a, as a resident of that area, looking at the positives, were you pleased with the level of social activism? Because this really seemed to galvanize the community. It set a new bar, didn't it? I think it did, yeah, to step yeah. up and say, yeah. you know what, this time we push back. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it all started uh, earlier this year. There was a big petition on change.org, you know, over 50,000 people signed it last I checked and, mm. and possibly more since. So I think people are conscious of the fact. I think Singaporeans, like myself, I am Singaporean, a lot of people in my neighborhood are too, are becoming more conscious of the fact that we just don't want to lose any more forest. Do you remember that awful story at the start of the year about that crunchy forest just yep. being accidentally, you know, torn down because the, the overzealous contractor mm. misread the instructions? I mean, how awful is that? It's just devastating that we're losing green pockets uh, within Singapore and, you know, increasingly there's going to be less and less. It, it adds to, you know, um, climate change. It's going to add to uh, the, the, yep. the already very hot days that we're experiencing. So, you know, there's, there's been studies about this. Come on, guys. You all know this, uh, you know, people listening in. You know this is bad for the environment. So why just, do it? And just very briefly, Sharon, yeah. it is changing, though, isn't it? I live out by the river in the uh, Senkang Pongal area. A lot of young families, mm. as you know, out in the east, the yeah. northeast of Singapore. And they've moved their deliberately you know in australia they'd be called sea changes i mean not quite to that extreme but this idea that we move to certain places not to set record you know sales when we sell our apartment but because we want greenery we want park yes. connectors we yeah. want rivers and seas and breezes and everything else to raise your family right? there is a change yeah. isn't there showing jit yeah i mean i i don't think my street of homes here um it, it is not I wouldn't say it's out there. We're out to make profits from our, our homes. We actually bought this place, uh, you know, about 10 years ago because we wanted to be exposed to that greenery because it was, it was just absolutely beautiful. And 
it was an asset. It, it was seen to be a, you know, something that people wanted to be close to. So, so why take it away? You know, we're going to have to spend mm. a couple of years now listening to piling behind our house. And I, I think it's truly tragic, truly devastating. I'm sure a lot of us are now looking to sell our homes. Yeah, so if anybody it's, wants it's, my place, <laughs> it's gorgeous, <laughs> wonderfully renovated. It will have a fantastic, you know, HTB development behind it in four years. I, or, you know, anyone who wants it, please get in touch with me. <laughs> so now she's doing sales pitches she's on so my FM. This is the first well, time I, we've firstly, had a sales a, I'm heartbroken a and devastated. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I really don't want to have to deal with having to see this, this development no. come up in the next couple mm. of years. It's going to be just you. appalling. All right. Let's move forward to uh, to our yep. first official story uh, on. The yeah, the reason I'm actually here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and then this is another story that is going to be devastating for a lot of investors and business owners. But there was a trillion dollar market meltdown in China this week. The government has been clamping down, especially on tech giants, Tencent, Alibaba and others. And this has led to a massive flight uh, from these. Uh, what do we know about this story and, and what its impact might be on the market there? Yeah, I mean, as you know, it all started with uh, DD, the ride hailing group, you know, they, they IPO'd at the end of June, they made $4.4 billion. And, you know, and then they got a couple of days later, a big slap, do- slap on the wrist by the Chinese government regulators. I mean, essentially, this is a story of, of state intervention, uh, you know, the Chinese government going after the big tech, not just big tech, but they're going after food delivery services, they're going after mm. the, the education sector and others. So there's a lot of concern amongst investors, you know, sure, they want to invest in these incredible Chinese companies because the they're, they're, they're levels of growth are just enormous, you know, they're exposed mm. to this incredible Chinese economy, and yet, you know, you're going to have to think about all of the concerns around, um, you know, regulation and, and state intervention. And in fact, I think the SEC just came out with a ruling just uh, yesterday saying that, uh, you know, Chinese companies that now want to list in the U.S. are going to actually have to, um, you know, provide and disclose uh, any kind of potential Chinese uh, government intervention that they might be exposed to. Well, I, you know, I don't even think these companies know. That's the problem. So I'm, I'm feeling really sorry for the investors who put their money into this and, and really sorry for actually quite a lot of these innovative Chinese companies because, mm. I mean, let's face it, um, you know, perhaps the state intervention is warranted. Perhaps, you know, uh, innovation has got ahead of legislation, as we've seen in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is also, you know, putting you know, the likes of Facebook and, and all the other big tech firms under scrutiny for, for antitrust issues. So, so China, too, is now catching up. Perhaps they've let these companies grow too big. I mean, that's certainly been the allegations against Alibaba, for instance, uh, who they, they went after last year. So, you know, you're seeing increasingly this happen. Um, But at the same time, you know, you do need these Chinese tech firms because we've seen, obviously, the U.S.-Chinese divide has meant that uh, the U.S. is now cutting China off uh, a lot of the technology that it needs to grow. So, you know, they're going to require more and more and need to, you know, rely on these Chinese companies to to kind of, you know, come up with innovation, come up with the fact that China wants to be this incredible technology superpower in the next couple of years. So, so it's really a fine line w- w- with what's going on. I think regulators in China are going to have to be very careful. If they want these companies to continue to innovate, continue to grow, continue to push China into that, uh, you know, into that space where it is truly a technology leader, they're going to have to back off a bit. So let's see how it plays out. It's, it's really interesting to see what's going on there. But what is interesting to me, uh, Sharon Jit, it's not just the big tech companies, is it? I mean, you mentioned their education. I'm looking at this figure here. They went after the, you know, the $120 billion yeah. private tutoring yeah. industry. If there's one thing we love in this part of the world, it, it, it's tu- tuition, right? It's yeah. a billion dollar industry for Singapore. Especially on the mainland, right? Right. Yeah. If you're an investor, yeah. you'd think that was the safest of investments, you know, the private yeah. tuition uh, industry. And at a stroke... They demanded yeah. to turn it into a non-profit. So Absolutely, to your earlier point, yeah. what, what is mm. this really about? Do they look at the U.S. and do they see the rise of, of billionaires and Europe to a lesser extent? They see the power. They mm. see that they're not above the law, but they're, they're, they're free economically to say and do whatever they choose to do, even fly to space if they want to. Mm. You know, do they yeah, see I mean, that as a potential concern in China? 
I, I think so. I think the gulf between um, uh, the, the wealthy and the poor is widening, as it is in many countries around the world. And a lot of this, you know, you can be seen right from the start. As soon as a child, um, it, it, you know, goes out into the world, you know, it going into schools, education, you can see that the wealthier ones are going to get all the tuition and all the help that they mm. need, and the poor ones aren't. So I think in a way you can kind of see why they're doing this. I mean, there's been this huge push towards... Uh, you know, common prosperity. This is something that the Chinese Communist Party has really been pushing. They, they want to see their legitimacy. Um, they, they want to say, look, we are trying to help everyone else. And now we're trying to, you know, potentially um, create this common prosperity. And we're, we're going to do it by going after these, these big tuition companies, these big tutorial mm. companies, these education companies, because they've been, uh, you know, growing very wealthy off the fact that uh, wealthier Chinese can afford uh, to get these, um, the, these the, the extra help that their kids yeah. need and the poorer kids don't. So yeah, you can kind of see that, but at the same time, you know, perhaps they are being a bit too um, you know, heavy handed. I mean, the yeah. worst thing you can do for any kind of, you know, um, uh, any kind of market is is to be heavy-handed state intervention is terrible for anything that requires innovation and companies to grow so again you know something that we're going to be watching um i really everyone's really quite interested to see how this is going to play out and particularly people who've invested heavily in some of these big uh, potentially yeah. growing companies it, the, you know, it'd be interesting to be a fly on the wall inside the CCP, right? There must be something going on in the halls of power where for many years they have really encouraged mm. this kind of innovation and, and pushing China ahead uh, in so many different ways. And now, as as you mentioned, Sharon Chi, it's, they're putting the brakes on it in a weird way. And, uh, yeah. you know, of course, there's I mean, no way we can China's totally know why. also relatively new at this. I mean, if you think about the stock market in Shanghai, I, I think it came up in the mm. late 1800s, but literally... They had to shut during uh, the advent of the Communist Party, and they reopened in 1990. The stock market's yeah. there only been around for about 30 years, you know, compared to the yeah. U.S., where you've got stock markets in New York from, you know, well over 200 years, years ago. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so it just feels yeah. like they're they're learning as they go along. They're very young at this, so you yeah. know, the regulators perhaps are going to have to learn how to do it properly, and and that's why people are so interested because. Yes, you can go in there and make a lot of money, but at the same time, you're going to have to be so careful because there is so much scrutiny on a lot of these companies now by the state, and there's going to continue to be state intervention. So something to watch. Right. Okay, good. Thanks. Let's move on. Uh, it was a, it's a big week for Singapore-U.S. relations. We had the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, in town earlier this week. Uh, we had notice uh, yesterday that Jonathan Kaplan is going to be um, uh, put up for the nominee to the be the next ambassador uh, to the Republic of Singapore, and the vice president is now planning to come here during the month of August. So what is going on with the U.S. and Singapore? <laughs> there is this massive push in the last, you know, three days, four days, uh, and after years of there being nothing going on, you know, more or less uh, between uh, during the Trump administration between the U.S. and Singapore. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's exciting. I mean, as a Singaporean, I'm, I'm so happy to see that there's so much attention and scrutiny on Singapore. So that's great. Um, obviously, Singapore it plays a crucial role. You know, it, it is a, a, an important small, but we're an important player in this whole dynamic between the U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. You've heard uh, our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung talk about how to uh, manage this fine balance, not be seen to be too, um, you know, reliant on, on one or the other. So it, it is a really fine balance that Singapore is playing, and great that we've had Lloyd Austin in the region talking about uh, the, the relations between the U.S. and China. And it was really, you know, quite a keynote speech, and he, the fact that he chose Singapore uh, as, as a location to make it, because we know the U.S., um, the Joe Biden administration has said that the, the issues between uh, the U.S. and China are some of the, the biggest geopolitical mm -hmm. risks this century. I mean, we're talking, after all, about the world's biggest and second biggest economy. So the fact that he made the speech here, the, back, the fact that he highlighted the need uh, to develop relations with China, um, you know, it's, it's something that's so crucial. And I'm also really excited about the new ambassador as well. I mean, I think he sounds amazing. You know, yeah. we've got this, this ambassador who's a tech entrepreneur. You know, he invented the, the flip cart 
um, a camera. And I think that's amazing that we have somebody like that. I mean, obviously, Glenn, you, you, you've known a lot of the previous U.S. ambassadors and American yourself, um, you know, and, and we've had some great ambassadors, Kirk Wager, David Edelman, you know, lawyers. We've had Frank Lavin, who, you know, came from the yeah. U.S. Treasury. So really interesting that now we should have this tech entrepreneur. So I think he's going to bring a whole new dynamic to Singapore. Uh, which, let's face it, Singapore's trying to be this uh, innovation hub. Uh, it's trying to attack, attract tech unicorns to come here. So um, a really great choice, I think, by the Biden administration mm. to, to send Jonathan Kaplan here. And I actually have a flip video phone. I have one. <laughs> I bought one back still in the day one. when they first came out. I still have it. Wow. I, I, have to, I don't know where it is, I'll be honest with you. I have to dig it out of a box somewhere, but I will, I'll try to bring it in next week. Absolutely. Well, I just hope really that cool. Jonathan hasn't invested too much in China's tech industry. Yes. <laughs> we don't know well, what actually, do you know what I've been reading? He's been investing in a lot of food tech. So, yeah, um, you, you know, the fact that he's a foodie as well, and let's face it, he's coming to Singapore. I'd like to think we have the best food in the world. I mean, I think he's going to have a great time. But there's an interesting point there, Sharon G, you just said, obviously, you, you work in communication, it's your job, it's your bread and butter. And over the years, you've interviewed all of the key ambassadors, both from the US and elsewhere. In your experience, bearing in mind, you, the new ambassador, Mr. Kaplan, will have to manage that tightrope between the US mm, and China. Mm. In your experience, what makes a good ambassador in Singapore? Yeah, Gosh, well, obviously, the top of the list is diplomacy, right? I mean, you're going to have to be very diplomatic. Uh, you, you have to, again, there's this fine line one needs to thread not to uh, offend too many people. But also, you know, obviously, the U.S. has uh, a role to play. It still sees itself as something of the policeman of the world. You know, you've still got to think about the issues in this region with the South China Sea and, and China's claims too much of that. So, yeah, it's a really, really important role to play. It's really strategic being in Singapore because, it, you know, we are a country that wants to attract um, U.S. investment or, in fact, investment from all over the world. So it's it's... It's, I think it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, you know, the kind of role he plays going forward. And the fact that, again, you know, a tech entrepreneur, never had one of those before, uh, that's going to be really, I, I think that's fantastic. And I, I, I can't wait to see, uh, you know, how, how his, uh, his, his uh, engagement plays out. Awesome. Sharon G., we have to leave it there today, but thank you so much for being with us this morning and your, uh, your comments on all these. Uh, 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 Mike Ang, one of our uh, yes. Facebook Live uh, viewers, says so what's sharon g doing next what's your next gig <laughs> because you were very coy right <laughs> when we interviewed you a few weeks ago yeah you, you were, were very much the diplomat you were very diplomatic. Time, i suspect you're going to be today but we'll try anyway do you, what's next do you have anything else to, to say this well time? i'll tell you what's next i'm getting on a plane on tuesday night to go to the uk it's the first time i'm getting wow. on a plane for like a year and a half plus and finally being able to escape yes my beautiful little heaven that is Singapore. It is 700 square kilometers, uh, you know, in terms of size, but it's going to be so nice to get off the tiny red yeah. dot. I'm actually going to the UK to um, settle my son into school. So we're really looking oh. forward to it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like a worthy endeavor. We're all fully and vaccinated. So we're very happy to go now. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll see plenty of pictures on social media of you with your mask on <laughs> as you're traveling. She'll be one of the only ones in the UK <laughs> with a mask, with a mask on. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I probably will be. The <laughs> well, they very much become the guinea pigs for the world yeah. on, on our behalf on that one. Which part of the UK is your son going to school? Um, he's going to a place in, um, it's, it, it's beautiful, it's close to Wales. It's a, it's a, a town called Shrewsbury. It's got it. a lovely school and, um, you know, he's in the um, Singapore junior rowing team. So it's got a, a big wow. emphasis on rowing. So, you know, you were talking about the Olympics earlier. They've been watching it, um, you know, wholeheartedly, particularly all the rowing competitions. And, uh, you know, and, and supporting the Singaporean, Joan. She did pretty well, we think. Anyway, but I'm glad she was out there. And uh, so fantastic to see Singaporean athletes do well. Awesome. Well, good wishes uh, to your son uh, and, and also safe travels to you. And we'll see you when you get back to Singapore. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care, guys. Sharon G. Sharon G. Lail, international journalist. Thank you. International News Review. Your time. Your money. Money FM 89.3.